Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Captain Toby, and I'm the host of today's very special program, Musical Chairs, presented by Vermont Symphony Orchestra Symphony Kids. Today, we are coming to you from the Ticonderoga Steamboat at the Shelburne Museum in Shelburne, Vermont, for some music and fun. We are here today with Chip Stulen, the Director of Preservation and Landscape at the Shelburne Museum. Okay, now Chip, tell us a little about the Steamboat Ticonderoga. Well, it is so great to have the Vermont Symphony Orchestra back here at the museum and on this vessel. Uh, she was built more than 115 years ago in 1906, and it was built for Lake Champlain, operated on Lake Champlain for about 47 years. We had the, uh, the fortunate connection with the Thai in that the museum owned the Ticonderoga at that point for the last couple of years that it was on the lake. Um, but it was getting old and aged and had to be you know, decommissioned basically. Um, but instead of decommissioning her totally, it was brought here to the Shelburne Museum grounds nearly two miles from the lake. They built a special railway system to bring it here to haul her over here on land. When it lost its crew in that, that time point, when it was no longer operating on the lake, the crew became the crew at the museum. And with, uh, with almost 50 other buildings here, it was, uh, it was a struggle to keep up with the upkeep. And so by the 1990s, it was determined to do a major restoration, which that's when I became involved with the Ticonderoga. And uh, we had a five and a half year restoration and now so many more people can be able to enjoy her thoroughly. And I hope everybody has a chance to come back to the Thai in the summer of next year when we're open again. Well, thanks so much for that fascinating history and thanks for having the VSO at this beautiful location. Great to have you here. Thanks a lot, Toby. Later on, we're gonna make a musical instrument together out of some things you may have somewhere in your house. You're going to need eight straight straws, a ruler, a marker or a pen, a pair of scissors, and some masking tape. So now's a great time to take a moment and see what you can find. At Musical Chairs, we will learn about what instruments make up a symphony orchestra. If you've ever seen a symphony orchestra, you've probably noticed that an orchestra is a large collection of musicians all playing together. And believe it or not, all of the instruments played in the orchestra belong to what we call instrument families. You might already know this from our previous shows. Or you might be asking yourself, what's an instrument family? Well. An instrument family is a group of instruments that share something very special in common. Can you think of some different ways that musical instruments create sound? Good thinking. Well, some instruments are plucked and also bowed. Some instruments are struck and shaken. And some instruments are played with our wind and with our mouths and breath. <coughs> instrument families are a lot like ingredients in a recipe. When you put them all together, you get something beautiful, unique, and tastefully magical. The orchestra is made up of four families of instruments. Strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion. Now how about this fluffy family of ducklings? Do they belong in an orchestra? No way! Today we're going to be learning about the woodwind family. But before we begin, I want to show you something really cool. Have you seen one of these? That's right, it's called a panpipe. And believe it or not, panpipes are one of the first and earliest woodwind instruments. Woodwinds are called woodwinds because they are made out of wood or played with a small whittled down piece of wood called a reed that is strapped to a mouthpiece. And that's the wood part. The wind part comes from using our winds, or our breath, to play them. And that's the wind part. Has anyone blown across the top of a plastic bottle at home? Or whistled on a piece of grass? Well then you've done exactly what woodwind players do when they play their instruments. Instruments like the flute and panpipes use our breath blown across a hole to make a sound. 
Reed instruments like the oboe and clarinet produce a sound by focusing air into a mouthpiece, which then causes a reed or reeds to vibrate. We will learn lots more about these instruments later today in the program. In the orchestra, the musicians who play the woodwind instruments sit in the middle between the strings and the brass. The main woodwind instruments in an orchestra are the flute, the oboe, clarinet, and the bassoon. Now to learn some more about the instruments of the woodwind family, we have brought a panel of woodwind experts. And today we are joined by some very special guests who are actually members of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. First up is Anne, who's here to tell us all about her instrument, the flute. Hi, Mr. Toby. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy and so pleased to be here today. As you mentioned, a woodwind instrument is basically just a tube made of metal or wood, and I blow on one end and my fingers cover holes and different finger combinations make different notes. I blow across my hole in the head joint, which is over here, just like blowing across a soda bottle. Now the word flute gets its name from a Latin word, flutus, F-L-U-T-U-S, which means breath. When I play my flute, I use a lot of air. The flute originates as far back as 4000 BC, a really, really, really long time ago. These flutes were made of clay or bone or wood and were probably played by shepherds to herd in their animals. Because the flutes used to be made out of wood and we use our breath to play them, they're considered a part of the wood wind family of instruments. In ancient Greek times, panpipes were popular just like the ones Mr. Toby showed you earlier, I have some of my own. Pan pipes are just a bunch of tubes tied together, and we have long tubes, which make a low sound, and shorter tubes that make a higher sound. Mr. Toby, I brought along other members of my flute family today. This is my bass flute, and the bass flute is pretty much twice as long as the regular flute. So it's twice as low. Oh, and bass flute's name is Balu. my alto flute which is just a little shorter than the bass flute and alto's flute name is Claude. <laughs> And I have Angel and Angelina. You've already met Angel. And Angel is the regular size flute. So you've heard me play Angel quite a bit. So last in line, and last but not least, is the Piccolo. And Piccolo's name is Pipsqueak. So the piccolo is named piccolo for, from an Italian word, flauto piccolo, which means little flute. Um, so it's exactly half the size. Piccolo plus, plus piccolo equals flute. a lot of flutes. And now we have a question for you from a young student who lives in Castleton, Vermont. Hi, my name is Gavin. Uh, I'm in fifth grade. I'm from Castleton. I'm 10 years old. 
And what's your favorite song? Oh, Gavin, that's a really tough question. There's just so much music out there that I love to play. But here's a piece called Tambourine. It's really fun to play. I teach it to all of my students. It was written by a French composer called Gossic. It was written during the French Revolution, and it has a military feel to it, but it's also very happy and celebratory. And a little silly. Thanks, Anne. And thank you, Gavit, for the great question. Next up, we have our friend Nancy here, who is an oboe player with the Vermont Symphony. She is super excited to share her instrument with all of you. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy, and this is the oboe. Can you say that with me? Oboe. It's kind of a silly word, isn't it? It means high wood in French, and if we're going to say it in French, we'd say oboe. And it means high wood because it's a relatively small woodwind instrument. So it's in the higher ranges. And it's made of wood, sometimes made of plastic, usually made of a dark black wood called grenadilla, sometimes a rosewood like this one. And it's a little unusual because it is played with this tiny little mouthpiece here. This mouthpiece, which I can take out of the oboe, is called a double reed and it's super small at the top. I don't know if you can see that. So tiny at the top. In fact, the tip of the oval reed is thinner than a human hair. It's very, very thin and very, very small. And so when I play it alone, I get the most beautiful sound. Are you ready? Ha! <coughs> huh. It's not very pretty, right? It's super squeaky. But the neat thing about the oboe is when I put it in the reed, in the oboe, I get this amplification and it sounds like this. can hear, the oboe is sort of in the lower range of the flute, and you'll hear soon that it's sort of in the middle range of the clarinet as well. And so it's called a high woodwind with the other ones. You'll meet some lower woodwinds later, they're in our family, um, and you'll understand why this is on the higher side, I think. And uh, it's a very focused sound. Can you hear that? The oboe sound is it's very um, direct, and it allows lots of different people in the orchestra to be able to hear us even when we're playing pretty softly. Let me show you how it sounds. I'm going to play a short little piece by Mozart. Hey Nancy. Now that you mentioned it, I've noticed something that happens at the beginning of a concert when I saw an orchestra play in the past. I think you called it tuning. What does it mean for the oboe to tune the orchestra? Great question, Mr. Toby. If you go to a concert where there's an orchestra playing on stage, the first sound you'll hear is the note A, like this. It's the job of the oboe player to play the note that the whole orchestra will tune to. We need to sync all our instruments up and make sure that we're all starting from the same place so that when we play the concert, it will sound great. It's a little bit like making sure everybody starts a road race in the same place, but this isn't a competition. But what's fun is that the oboe gets the first solo of every concert. Now that's really cool. Thanks so much for explaining that, Nancy. Now we have a question for you from a student who lives in Greensboro, Vermont. Hi, I'm, I live in Greensboro, 
how my question is. Are there different sizes of the pieces that are wood that go inside the woodwind instruments? What a great question. Yes, all of the woodwinds use different sizes of reeds to make their sounds. The clarinet reed is longer and flatter and it's a single reed. And the bassoon reed is also a double reed like the oboe, but it's wider and bigger. So you're gonna get lots of different sounds from these instruments. The neat thing about the oboe and the bassoon is that we get to make our own reeds. They start out looking like this. And then after we wiggle them down and tie them up, we end up with oboe reeds and bassoon reeds that we can play on. It's a lot of fun because we get to make our own instruments. And I think you're going to get a taste for this soon because I think you're going to get to make your own instruments. Have fun. I want to play something for you now, though. I want to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, a tune I think you know. I'm going to do it in a slightly different way, though. I'm going to do it using harmonics and multiphonics. Those are just fancy words for different ways to make notes happen on the instrument. You want to hear what it sounds like? Kind of silly, isn't it? I'm just trying to show you that there are lots of different ways that you can make sounds on instruments and you can use all those sounds to create different emotions and say what you want to say on the instrument and it makes it so much fun. There's one more thing I want to tell you about the oboe. It's a really old instrument. If you go and find pictures from ancient Greece or hieroglyphics from Egypt, you can find pictures of the oboe. Well, it was called an aulos back then, but it sounded a lot like the oboe and it was played with a double reed. And even today, there are modern versions of that in places like India. If you go to India and you see this instrument called a pungi, it's often used in snake charming rituals. Maybe you can hear a little bit of oboe in that. Let me see. Wow, Nancy, we're not in Vermont anymore. That sound really takes us on a magical journey to a different place entirely. Now let's go visit another country, the Philippines, to learn about another woodwind instrument from around the world. Located in Southeast Asia, the Philippines is a country made up of over 7,600 islands in the Pacific Ocean. A kaolung is a flute-like instrument popular in the northern part of the Philippines. It is roughly two feet long and is made from bamboo. The kalalung has holes cut into it, which players cover to create different notes. What makes the kalalung unique is that it is actually a nose flute. Instead of blowing air into it through the mouth, players blow air into it through their nostril. Well, that sure is a unique way to play a wind instrument. Don't you think so? And now we're going to turn it back over to the Vermont Symphony musicians so they can tell us about the last two instruments in the woodwind family. The next instrument in the woodwind family is called the clarinet. And our friend Kelly plays the clarinet in the symphony, and she's here to tell us all about her instrument. Thanks, Mr. Toby. Happy to be here with all of you. I'm going to tell you all about the clarinet. In early Baroque years, composers such as Bach and Handel were putting new demands on the skills of trumpeters who were required to play melodic passages in the high register, <clears throat> often referred to as the clarion register. See where I'm going with this? Clarion, clarino, clarinet. For a brief period, mock trumpets were used for this particular task until a guy named Johann Christoph Denner came along. He is believed to have invented the clarinet in Germany around 1700 or so. There was an instrument called the shalomo, and Denner added a register key, and voila, the clarinet was born. It sounds like this.
orchestra, the clarinet often takes on the task of playing the melodies because it has a warm sound and is easy to hear over the top of other instruments. It is also very good at blending with the other instruments of the wind section while playing harmonies. You'll sometimes hear a clarinet in other groups and other styles of music, such as in marching band and jazz groups. Overall, it is a very versatile instrument. The clarinet has five parts. The bell, ding, 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 ding. The lower joint, the upper joint, this little teeny guy called the barrel, and also the mouthpiece. This is where all the magic happens. <clears throat> When I put this hunk of wood on the mouthpiece, you see that? When I put it on my mouthpiece and clamp it down with my ligature and blow into it, I get a high-pitched sound. It's a really good way to annoy mom, dad, siblings, and pets. The reed I have is made from a single piece of wood, unlike the two pieces that the oboe or bassoon use. My single reed vibrates up against the flat facing part of the mouthpiece and the sound is created. As I add the barrel, let me play just the mouthpiece first. So as I add the barrel, See that? See all the keys? All these here. And then tone holes right here. Okay? As I add or take away my fingers, on and off of these, the pitch is either raised or lowered, like this. What a whirlwind of notes! Now we have a question for you from a young musician who lives in Winooski, Vermont. Hi, my name is Lily. I live in Winooski, Vermont, and I'm 10 years old, and my question is what makes the clarinet so special? One of the reasons I especially like playing the clarinet is its ability to play really low and really high. The range of an instrument is the distance from the lowest pitch it can play to the highest pitch it can play. The clarinet has a range of approximately four octaves, which is more than any other woodwind instrument. This is the lowest note I can play. And this is just about the highest note I can play. Well, that's quite a range. Now I have a question for you, Kelly. When I've gone to see the Vermont Symphony perform, I've noticed that the clarinet players sometimes have two clarinets and they switch back and forth. Unlike the flute and the piccolo, the clarinets look almost identical. Do you need two because one clarinet gets tired and needs the other one to take over so it can have a break? <laughs> Not quite. Generally speaking, the clarinet is pitched in B flat. But I also have one pitched in A, which I use for a lot of orchestral playing. Although they look very similar, the two clarinets are used for playing in different keys and also have a unique timbre, which is just a fancy word to describe the character or quality of the sound. So if you ever come to a VSO concert, which I hope you will, you will now understand why we often have two instruments next to each other. Thanks for explaining that to us, Kelly. 
Now last but certainly not least, we're moving on to the final major instrument in the woodwind family of the orchestra, the bassoon. We have our friend Janet here with us who plays the bassoon in the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. Thank you, Mr. Toby. As Mr. Toby said, my name is Janet and I have been playing with the Vermont Symphony for a very long time. I also love teaching bassoonists of all ages. And what I really like doing is showing off the bassoon. And before I say anything else about the bassoon, I'm going to play a little tune for you so you can hear what the bassoon sounds like. Well, as you can see, the bassoon is a very, very big, instrument. And what's fun about the bassoon is twice as long as it looks. It's really an eight foot long pipe that has been folded in half. Now I wanted to show you how long eight feet was. So I found two ski poles and they were both four feet long. So I put them together. Now let me, I have to look for them though. Where? where I don't know what I did. With, what did oh, here it is. All right, here, let me show you what eight feet looks like. It comes out here, and I grab it. Oh, it's still going. Holy smokes. All right, here it comes. Comes back. Ah, there we go. Wow, eight feet long. Well, you know, why do you have an instrument that's eight feet long? Well, there's a very important historical reason for that, because Thousands of years ago, people would sing, but they'd only sing one line, just a melody. That was it. And hundreds of years went by, and somebody said, oh, maybe I could write something for two voices. And the duet was born. And hundreds more years went by, and somebody else says, oh, uh, maybe three voices. Three would be great. So somebody wrote a third line, and then... They said, well, let's invite all our instrument friends to come and play with us. And several hundred more years went by, and somebody said, well, if we can do three voices, and we certainly can do four voices, but we want to write parts that go way lower than what our lowest instrument can play right now. And that instrument was the trombone. So what they had to do, they figured out they had to make an instrument that was eight feet long. So they got people to create these eight foot long straight pipes. Now there was a problem there in that the holes were so far apart that they couldn't reach with their fingers. So somebody else had to invent the keys. Now I have some keys on my bassoon. It's really fun. Let me show you my favorite key, which is this one right here. And it goes here and it goes all the way up here. There's a hole. And the key has to close that hole. And that was a great invention if you were going to have an eight foot long instrument. Well, so that was okay, but you know, the problem with an eight foot long straight instrument is that they had to take their step ladders with them everywhere they went because it was so big they couldn't just put it out in front of them. Or I guess they could invite a few of their friends to come along as well. So finally, somebody invented a little YouTube, a little rounded tube where you could cut your eight foot instrument in half and then attach that at the bottom so that you created a continuous pipe. Now let me show you on my instrument how that works. So we start here and it goes down, around, down here, and that is, is called the YouTube. Not the one that you see on your computer, but then it goes all the way back up here through the total eight feet of the bassoon. Hey Janet, how on earth are you able to hold up all that tubing? Your instrument must weigh a ton. Excellent question. Well, the bassoon is about six pounds, I would say. So it's a little awkward to hold. So in order to hold it up, I have to use my neck strap when I am standing. And then when I sit, I have a strap that attaches at the bottom of my instrument and I put it over my chair and then that keeps the instrument up. All right, so I've showed you my keys. I showed you my holes. These help change the notes. 
but the most important thing that I have is my little sound source called the double read. Now Nancy showed you her double read and she talked about the fact that there was cane and the cane grows to be, oh, I don't know, seven or eight feet. Uh, wait a minute, what is this? This is cane, the bamboo-like substance. However, this one is not when it's growing in the field, which has leaves and it's green and looks like a real nice plant. This one has been cut down and it has been taken to special barns to dry for a couple years. And then when it dries like this, they cut it into pieces and they ship it off to people who make their own reeds. So let me show you my cane reed, my double reed. It's bigger than Nancy's. There's a little hole in the end. There's a hole in this end. That means it vibrates all by itself. And the sound that I can get with this is just so special that I thought you really needed to hear this. So let me play this really gorgeous sound for you. Just so, just a moment. Let me get ready here. Uh, well, maybe lovely to a duck or maybe good for a New Year's Eve party. But if you're very clever, which of course I am, you can play a little tune like... How about Mary Had a Little Lamb? Let me, let me try that one. Whoa, man. It sounds a lot better on the, my eight foot long pipe, I can tell you that. So, you know what? My specialty is playing low notes. But the bassoon has a very large range. I can play low, but I can go up pretty high. So what I'd like to do is to play a chromatic scale for you. I'm going to start on my very lowest note, and I'll go up to one of my highest notes so you can hear the full range of the instrument. quite high and quite low as well. Well, I'm going to go back into my low specialty and I'm going to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, but this time I want you to help me. Okay? I would like to have you help me play Mary Had a Little Lamb. So let's do this. Get your imaginary reed and give it a crow. <laughs> then you want to put it on your vocal. Okay. Now take your left hand. You're going to put it on top. Take your right hand and put it at the bottom. Now, take a big breath. Are you ready? Here we go. job everybody and that's the bassoon wonderful janet that was a lot of fun thanks so much for teaching us about the bassoon we now have a very special guest we'd like you all to meet and this is a flute player from middlesex vermont who would like to tell you our viewers a bit about what it's like to be a young musician hi thanks for joining us can you tell us your name and how old you are my name is Mayla, and i'm 12. Now, could you please show us your instrument and tell everyone how long you've been playing the flute? This is my flute, and I've been playing since I was four. Are there any accessories that you use for your instrument or anything you have at home that you need for practicing and playing? Um, I use a metronome so I can play things at specific times, and I have this um, cloth and stick to clean it, and I also use a music stand. Well, that's great. Now, tell us, why did you pick the flute? Um, my older friend played it, so I wanted to play it. I've heard you've been practicing a very special piece you'd like to share with us. Could you please tell us what it is and play it for us? It's called Humoresque, and it's by A. Dvorak. <laughs>
Amazing. Hey, everyone at home, can you clap and cheer once more for Mela's wonderful performance? Well, Mela, you must really love playing the flute and have been doing lots of practicing to get that good. Can you share with us why you love making music and what's the best part about it? Um, I can play songs that I like listening to and it's really fun to play with other people. Would you encourage other kids to try it too? Yes. Well, thank you, Mela. We sincerely appreciate your time and willingness to share your instrument and music with all of us. For those of you who don't have a woodwind instrument at home, but would like to try playing one, pay special attention to this next segment, where I'm going to show you how to make your very own straw pan flute at home. Once again, you will need eight straws, a pair of scissors, a pen or a marker, a ruler, and masking tape. Now don't worry if you don't have these things on hand right away. We'll be sure to post a recipe for making this on VSO's website for later. Now the first thing we're going to do when we build our straw pan flute is grab our straws. Now we recommend that you use wide straws for this particular project. Now as you see here, I've laid out eight straws. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ruler and my pen and make marks on these straws for where we're going to cut. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take your marker and make marks on each one of the eight straws where you're going to cut. So let's start with the first one. The first one you will measure 9.5 centimeters and make a mark. The second one you will measure 10 centimeters and make a mark. The third one, 11.5, then 13 centimeters, then 14.5, then 15.5, 17, and lastly, 19.5. Now don't worry, you don't need to remember all those numbers. They'll be posted on the recipe for this instrument on the VSO's website. The next step is we're going to take our scissors and cut very carefully along each one of the lines just like this. Now remember to keep this piece here that you've cut out for later. And now that you've cut all of your straws or pipes, the next step is that you lay out all of your straws from longest at the top to shortest at the bottom. And remember how we were saving the ends of the pieces of straw that we were cutting? Well, now's the time to use them. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put them in between each one of your straws, just like this, so that we have lots of space in between our straws or pipes when we blow. And now that we've laid everything out accordingly, it's time for the last step, where we tape our straw pipe together. Now, take your masking tape, and put it right over the center of your instrument, just like this. And once you've got it nice and firm, you can actually flip the instrument over, and it all stays together. And pull your tape out just a little bit more. Like that. And voila, everybody. We have our very own straw pan flute. Now let's hear what it sounds like. Anyone recognize that? A major scale. Well, that's just about it for today's Musical Chairs, presented by Vermont Symphony Orchestra's Symphony Kids. I'd like to say a big thank you to our special guest musicians from the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, our young student musician, and to our host Chip at the Ticonderoga Steamboat at the Shelburne Museum. Orchestral music can be so much fun, and we want you to know that you, yes you, can be a part of it. We say goodbye with an arrangement for woodwinds of Vermont state song, These Green Mountains, performed by our guest musicians, Anne, Kelly, Nancy, and Janet. We encourage you to sing along at home and to tune in next week for our segment on the percussion family. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>